Sydney Bridge is probably one of Florida's most famous ghost stories. It is centered around an old steel frame bridge that spans the Chipola River in the swamps north of Mariana, located in the Florida Panhandle. The oldest report of a ghost being sighted at Bellamy Bridge is from a Mariana newspaper. Mariana, a small quiet town today, was just a small wilderness village 150 years ago. The territory had opened for settlement in 1821, and after learning of the rich land from Andrew Jackson's soldiers who had crossed North Florida in 1818, many families flocked to the region to start a new and prosperous life. The red clay land had been described as excellent for rowing cotton, corn, and sugarcane, and the swamp land quite picturesque. Along with those flooding into the area, there were Samuel and Edward Bellamy, two brothers that moved to Jackson County in the early 1830s when the town had big plantations popping up everywhere. Although both men were physicians from North Carolina, like so many, they came to the area to seek their wealth as planters. Bellamy also took a great interest in the creation of statehood, which he believed would benefit Florida. His business interests brought him to the home of Mr. William Croom, a fellow North Carolinian and prominent member of the local planting aristocracy. On this visit, the lone bachelor was shy and a little awkward around women. He met Croom's daughter, Elizabeth. She was the most beautiful woman Samuel had ever seen as she sat embroidering in the shade of the plantation garden, her chocolate brown hair shining in the sunlight. After a bit of reluctance, Samuel worked up the courage to awkwardly ask the coy Elizabeth what she was embroidering on her handkerchief. Noticing the blush in his cheeks, she smiled and showed him the outline of her initials on the lace-trimmed fabric. The pair discovered they had similar interests in life and began a courtship. They came to be known as quite the it couple in the small planter town. Elizabeth's initials became an intimate joke between the pair with Dr. Sam often coming up behind the bouncy, cheerful Elizabeth and whispering EJC, EJC in her ear. One day, Bellamy asked Elizabeth to go out with him to his brother Edward's plantation. In 1835, Edward built the huge two-story red brick home on a rise of land about a half mile from the Chipola River. The home stood at the end of a winding red dirt road edged with huge live oaks and poplars. It was constructed with tall white columns, marble mantles, and a gorgeous oak front double door that opened into an immense hallway, which ran to the rear of the house. The entrance hall was adorned with cut glass chandeliers and gold accents. Elizabeth had never seen anything like it. The young couple then took a stroll to a nearby clearing where Sam shared the vision of building a family home near his favorite rock cave down along the river. Pointing out all the special places in the home that would be just for her, they stared out over their future home and imagined their children laughing and playing down by the river. By the light of a lighter knot torch, Bellamy showed Elizabeth the cave walls blackened by the fires from Native Americans and the long formations growing from the ceiling and the floor of the cave. Samuel took Elizabeth's hand and guided her through the deep caverns of the cave, explaining the science behind the natural formations. As they headed back to the sunlit entrance, Bellamy stopped, dropped to his knee, and asked Elizabeth to become his wife. With tears in her eyes, Elizabeth whispered, Yes, as her new fiancé scooped her up in a loving embrace and they shared a kiss in the afternoon sun. As the couple gleefully returned to the house, they came upon a covered bridge. They stopped to admire the yellow spring flowers, and Sam teased Elizabeth about needing to embroider new handkerchiefs. Once they were married, she'd be EJB instead of EJC. Elizabeth smiled and laughed, content in this happy moment, Grabbing her arm gently, Bellamy said, You're good for me, Elizabeth. You lift my dark moods. With theatrical groups and traveling circuses making their appearances in Mariana at that time, Bellamy decided to give his future wife the advantages of both city and country life. He began construction of a two-story Mariana townhouse for her, 
which, when completed, would boast stately white columns and broad steps running the full length of the stunning southern veranda. He spared no cost for his love, importing the finest furnishings from Europe. Weeks and weeks of preparation went into the Bellamy wedding, which was to take place in the lavish townhouse. A team of local women fashioned Elizabeth's custom wedding gown from white imported silks, then embroidered the dress with hundreds of tiny white roses and a twisted vine wrapping from the hem to the neckline. Atop her delicate long veil, a diamond tiara that belonged to Elizabeth's mother completed the look. The wedding was an ordeal, with guests arriving in Mariana a full week before the nuptials. Some remained in town, others journeyed out to the Bellamy Plantation, where Edward and his wife Anne warmly welcomed the revelers to their home. Days were full of feasts and games, while the nights were reserved for dancing and campfire chats along the river. The morning before the wedding, Sam and Elizabeth rode out to the plantation to visit with their loved ones. The entire party mounted horses, while the couple slowly guided them down to the river. In the quiet woodland setting, festooned with Spanish moss and blossoming magnolias near the bridge, Sam presented Elizabeth with his wedding gift. After she examined the large diamond-studded cross with E.J.B. engraved on the back, she held it to her breast and whispered, Forever and always. The wedding took place in the Rose Garden behind the new townhouse the afternoon of May 11th, 1837. Elizabeth's ten attendants wore hooded gowns of pink and white pineapple silk. After the vowels were recited, the guest enjoyed a festive evening of feasting and dancing, plus bottles of expensive Madeira and imported champagne. In the early evening hours, after the candles and lamps were lit, most of the people moved into the central ballroom of the townhouse, where all the furniture had been removed and straight-back chairs lined the walls. It was after Elizabeth had removed her long wedding veil that tragedy struck. Sam and Elizabeth were whirling and twirling around on the dance floor, caught up in the music of a beautiful waltz when suddenly the back of Elizabeth's gown brushed too close to one of the candelabras and caught fire. Elizabeth screamed frantically trying to extinguish the flames but Sam and the other guests stood motionless for what felt like eternity, not fully realizing what had happened. The panic-stricken bride dashed outside as the flames leapt up her back toward her long brown hair. Together, both Edward and Sam snatched the rug from the polished oak floor and raced after Elizabeth. As soon as they reached her, they threw her on the ground and smothered the flames. Sam then carried his bride upstairs to the bedchamber where they were to spend their wedding night. He snatched scissors from the dresser and began cutting away the burnt section of her wedding gown. At first, both Edward and Sam cared for Elizabeth, rubbing the burns on her writhing body with a fresh salve. Sam alternated between acting the calm professional to shouting like a madman and crying, how could this happen to my beautiful wife? When he realized it was only a matter of time, Edward administered morphine. Then Sam ordered his brother out of the room so he could hold Elizabeth alone in his arms one last time. The next morning, they transported Elizabeth's charred remains to Bellamy Plantation. In the great hallway, family and friends paid their respects by the cypress casket covered with the long white bridal veil. Elizabeth carried her diamond cross, wedding ring, and a string of pearls from her father with her to the grave. She was buried down from the house in a grove of live oaks at the family burial place as the golden sun descended in the apricot sky and the whippoorwills began their mournful song. Samuel Bellamy mourned for several months after his young bride's tragic death. In a depressed and bitter state, he bordered on insanity but erected a tombstone for his beloved bride that read, sacred to the memory of Elizabeth Jane, late wife of Samuel C. Bellamy and daughter of General William Croom of North Carolina, who departed this life 
at her residence in Florida, May 11th, 1837, aged 18, two months. That same year, Bellamy became a Union Bank appraiser. In 1840, the Florida Territory began experiencing the rippling effects of the financial panic of 1837 that resulted in a depressed condition of the United States. The following year, the Union Bank was faced with default due to falling cotton prices, yellow fever, and hurricanes. In 1843, the bubble burst, and the Union Bank closed its doors. In his later years, Bellamy would often drown himself in a bottle of whiskey and ride out to his brother's plantation. From the dirt road, he would gaze at his many nieces and nephews riding ponies or chasing wooden hoops across the front lawn and dream of what might have been. Then after dark, in the light of the full moon, he would ride to the river and stare gloomily across at the graveyard where his beloved Elizabeth lay sleeping. Bellamy never remarried, nor did he ever have any children. He loved his Elizabeth for the rest of his days. And according to the Tallahassee Floridian, three days after Christmas on December 28, 1853, Samuel C. Bellamy ended his life by lifting a razor and slitting his throat. Today, Elizabeth Jane Bellamy's tombstone is the only reminder of the tragedy that took place so many years ago. It stands about a half mile from the river in an overgrown field near a few crumbling bricks and an old cistern. On Halloween, groups gather in the haunted area down by the river, hoping to catch a glimpse of the ghostly silhouette. And on the anniversary of the tragedy, each May, several Chipola College students keep a midnight vigil. According to legend, Elizabeth's spirit came back at the moment of Samuel's death. She had promised to love him forever and always, and has been walking the swamps around Bellamy Bridge in search of him for more than 160 years. Hi there, it's your host, Ashley McLaughlin. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for tuning in to Southern Haunts. And if you like what you hear, feel free to leave a review and subscribe to the podcast to make it easier for others who like to hear haunty, spooky stuff too. Thanks. Bye.